Good evening, brothers and sisters. Well, we've had a wonderful day to get together. The weather was beautiful, but we were all inside enjoying fellowship, and it was a precious time. Uh, I would like for us to read some verses as we begin tonight, beginning with the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And then back in 1 Corinthians, let's read a few verses before we get to our theme verse. Beginning in verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning in verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not, mighty, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised, God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And then I want us to consider two passages in the Old Testament. Now, we never plan these things, and I want to speak tonight and use Jacob as an example. <laughs> For those of you who are here this afternoon, you realize that David has severely undercut my message. <laughs> However, it must be the Lord that wants to remind us again and again of this wonderful illustration of how Jacob becomes Israel. Who am I? So we'll look at some verses in Genesis 28. This is when he first heads out on his own and discovers the Lord in a living way. Then uh, verse 10 of Genesis 28. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I'll keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, being a good millennial, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And now we go down to the moment at the river Jabbok, referred to this afternoon in Genesis chapter 32. 
So we'll look at verse 24 and a few verses. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. Just another moment of prayer. Our Father, we come to you tonight realizing that the Holy Spirit has been given to us to magnify the Lord Jesus. We pray that as we fellowship on these tremendous matters together, that you will meet us and speak to our hearts and teach us how to live in such a way that is pleasing to you. We thank you for all gathered here. Do quicken us in body and spirit. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, our brother began where I began. Who am I is a big question today. It's a millennial obsession, according to psychologists. And psychology today says that who I am is the most universally asked question. So I googled it. <laughs> who am I? And in 1.7 seconds received 150 million entries. It's amazing. Then I looked up who am I in book finder. Book after book after book after book after book. And then I looked up who am I seminars. And there's pages of them, mostly on college campuses today. Everybody's asking, who am I? Now, I read this article in Psychology Today, not my favorite magazine, but uh, it's interesting, where the psychologist I was reading, a modern pop psychologist, said, actually, we can't know who we are because we're a dynamically changing person according to those things surrounding and affecting us. So you can't know who you are. And they talk about what a problem this is for insecure people who need that stability of knowing who they are, but you never can know because who you are is always changing. <laughs> and it's a problem for the proud and stuck because they're stagnant in who they think they are, but they're not really that. So nobody can know. The solution of the psychologist was this. You'll never know who you are. So let it be what you do. Be brave. Try new things. Quit your job. Move to a new place. Divorce your wife. <laughs> you see, you don't want to get stagnant if who you are is what you do. And of course we know, as soon as we meet somebody on the road, we say, hi, what's your name? He says, Mel. You say, what do you do? Who am I? Well, uh, the psychology is right about one thing. If a soul looks at a soul, they never can find out what a soul is. The more a soul looks at a soul, the more a person says, who am I? And the more they look at their belly button, the more deception and questions and insecurities take them in a downward spiral. Man's sin brings him on a downward spiral. Now here we are Christians, we get, this is a theme for us. Well, let's put ourselves in biblical perspective. Our dear brother this afternoon shared a question that remained on Jacob's mind for the rest of his life. And that's the question we should be asking. Who is he? 
Who am I in Christ Jesus? The who am I together isn't worth a nickel. In Christ Jesus is such a grand and tremendous and profound thing that we really need to find ourselves in pursuit of who he is. Now I will tell you the secret that will be the underpinnings of what I have to share for the rest of the night. If we pursue the Lord Jesus with all our heart, mind, and strength, wanting to know only who he is, reflexively we discover who we are. It is not as we look at ourselves and say, who am I, that we find anything except something that would trouble you. But if you have as your aim that you will pursue the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have found a wellspring of clues along the way of who you are. The very fact that Jesus said, I know where I come from and I know where I'm going, comes as a result of the fact that he spent no time thinking about himself. Hmm, boy, what am I doing here? What's going on? He spent his time in fellowship with a magnificent father. And in that fellowship, secrets were divulged that gave him that confidence of knowing who he was. There are secrets in Christ Jesus, but the magnitude of our Christ is the question here. If it's a small Christ, then the who am I is big. And so it was in the case of Jacob, right? But the larger our Christ becomes, the more the who am I becomes a foolish question. <laughs> because as we follow, as we wonder who he is, how large he is, how tremendous he is, reflexively, we begin to see who we are. So you don't find it by direct search, you find it by searching him. And we discover who we are. Now that's gonna be uh, my basic uh, tenet for tonight, so if you're satisfied with that, then you're through. <laughs> that's why I think when somebody's become a new believer and just discovered Christ, what I always recommend is this. You need to scour the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Discover who your Savior is. Let him grow in your sight. Watch him in the Gospels. This is the first entrance into a discovery of who we are in Christ. It's by looking at him. Look, your life is now hid with Christ in God, right? So if you try to look all the time for a hiding, you don't find. But if you look at the things above, where Christ is, all kinds of hidden things come to you, and you begin to understand wonderfully who you are. So our gospel is the first entrance into who I am as we see ourselves in him. Miracle of miracle, the salvation is we begin to see ourselves in him. Now, what does that mean? Paul gives us in Romans chapter 5 a mega picture of man. He says that man is basically made up, when you sum it up, in Adam and in Christ. There are two uh, corporate men. Are you in Adam? Are you in Christ? This is the first discovery that we need to discover. Now, of course, by default, we're in Adam. And Adam can't possibly know who he is. Adam looks at Adam. Adam looks at Adam. I look at you, you look at me. I say, I don't like that guy. That guy says, I don't like you. Or maybe we say, hey, I like you. Or maybe I say, I idolize you. I want to be like you. And you know that's always going to be dissatisfying. But since I don't know who I am, I look around and I say, 
mm, I think I'm that guy. And then I try to be like that guy. Adam has no idea who he is. And why is that? Because at the very foundation of our being, created being, we were made in the image of God. But with our bodies and souls very alive and our spirits dead to God, there's no way we can ever know who we really are. A man without spirit is not man. You, just body and soul, living in your flesh, that's not really you. And so Adam has this problem. He seeks and seeks to discover, but he never can find because his spirit's dead. But the key to mankind understanding who we are came in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This was the miracle of creation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. As Isaiah puts it, in the regions of uh, the Galilee of the Gentiles, they who sat in darkness suddenly saw a great light. What was that great light? Jesus walking upon this earth. They saw God. People in Israel talked about God all the time. But now they saw God, God's love, God's truth, God's power, God's wisdom, God's redemption. They saw it in Christ. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. As the last Adam, here was a man in the image of God. Here was a man, spirit, soul, and body, all functioning. Paul described the last Adam in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, he says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, until we are born again, until our spirits are made alive unto God, we have no clue who we are. You may be the best of psychiatrists. Listen, all I can tell you is my father was a psychiatrist for 50 years when he got saved. And he had no idea who he was until he got saved. But when he got saved, he looked at Jesus. And as he looked at this last Adam, he saw what man in the image of God looks like. And so when people in Galilee, in Judea, looked at Jesus, they saw God, but they also saw man. They looked at Jesus and said, that's what a man's supposed to be. Look how much he loves children. Look how humble he is. Look how transparent he is. Look how full of emotions. How wonderful his love images God. They saw not only God, they saw man. And Luke's gospel, if you will tread through Luke's gospel and look and look and look, you will discover the first man you've ever seen. He is the man of man. He is the son of man. He is man in the purpose of God. He is a son. And this is what we're all destined to become. But first you have to see it in him. So why did all of those lame and sick and cast off people come to Jesus they knew that they were, as it were, inhuman. But when they saw Jesus, they, they connected with that. They said, now that's right. Now I'm wrong. That's right. Because when you see the last Adam, you see Adam in you, right? If you see the perfection of Jesus and you're standing there, you fall down as a sinner. Say, I, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Then he picks you up and he says, oh, yes, you are. So Jesus, in his incarnation, the more we study, the more we look at him, 
the more we will begin to understand who we are. This is the beginning of how we see ourselves in Christ. It's when he says, come unto me, and we come unto him. We discover God. We discover humanity. That's what the theologians say. Without the incarnation, there can be no humanity of mankind. It is the way of our understanding and life. So, so when we meet Jesus, we meet God, and we meet our brother. Now, you may not understand who you are yet by looking at him, but who you are in Christ is becoming apparent as you see him as a human being. And the more you acknowledge and the more you see him, so what happens to somebody when they see Christ and they get saved? Well, here's what happens. Oh, to be like him. Oh, to be like him. Stamp your impression deep in my heart. Listen, when we see Jesus, if you have seen Jesus, you want to be like Jesus. It's not saying you could ever be like Jesus, but you want to be like Jesus. Even though it's impossible, you realize, I could never be like Jesus, yet there's something in you that says, I can be like Jesus. Because he's a human, I'm a human. I, he saved me, I can be. And so the first response of many Christians is the imitation of Christ. Now, I want just to say this. There are many, many Christians who leave, lead wonderful, godly lives trying to imitate Christ. They read the Sermon on the Mount. They try to do it. They turn the other cheek and, you know, all kinds of stuff. They try to be holy. They try to be loving. They try to preach the gospel. Now they're imitating Christ. And I think that's a noble venture. Now I know we all kind of say, ah, fooey, fooey, because we know the outcome of it. But let's not go there yet. It's okay for a new Christian to wear, what would Jesus do? Because really they're imitating the one they love. They want to be like Jesus. And so they, and so I, I want to just sort of underscore what Max said last night. How important it is for us to stand in the truth of the word of God and take it by faith. Listen to that wonderful thing. And by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Now, have you laid hold of that? I like what Max said. It doesn't really matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how spiritual you feel tonight. There is a fact for God, by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. And look at all these things he's been made to you. Take it. Do you need wisdom? Oh, wonderful. The Christian can go to God and say, God, I lack wisdom. I need wisdom. And he gives us wisdom. Isn't that wonderful? And righteousness. Oh, I take his righteousness as my righteousness. I wear a robe of righteousness. Jesus bought it with his precious blood, and now I am righteous in Christ Jesus. Wear it. It's the truth. I'm a saint. You notice that when uh, Paul introduces the uh, first Corinthians, he calls them saints. We would call them anything but saints. But they are saints. Claim you're a saint by the precious blood of Jesus. And you are redeemed. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Sing it. Say it. It's true. Oh, listen. I think we've discouraged people running after Christ. I think we've discouraged people loving Christ, wanting to imitate Christ. Let me tell you, there is no more noble man to imitate. Paul says imitate Christ. This is the first stage where we discover so much wonderful about Jesus, how wonderful he is. Oh, the more you see him in the Gospels, the more you want to be like him. Isn't that your heart? Now, I know some of you have become discouraged trying to imitate him, but we'll get to that in just a minute. You see, that's why Paul is writing this, uh, these passages we're talking about, where we're dealing with who I am, 
and he's writing this to the Corinthians. It's because he's known by experience that if you try to imitate Christ, you will hit a wall. And he wants the Corinthians to understand that their next step forward into knowing Christ is also their next step forward into knowing who they are, and it's by stepping into Christ crucified. After saying, by his doing, we're in Christ Jesus, who's been made to us, wisdom and righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Then he says, so that nobody will boast. What's the problem? These Corinthians have forgotten that they were in Adam. Not many of you called were what? Noble, mighty, wise. You were nothing. And yet Jesus called you. So don't look at yourself and say, hey, I'm Mr. Big Shot now. I'm, I'm a Corinthians and I, I, I speak prophecy now. I, I, I know the doctrines. I, I'm a really good teacher. You know, the Corinthians were fighting all this kind of stuff about who's the best. And they, they get to a, a meeting and they, the next thing you know, somebody's speaking in tongues and somebody jumps up and prophesies. And it just all gets out of order because everybody's competing. Now, the reason behind it is, Paul says, You've fallen behind in no gifts. You really love the Lord. That's how he starts off his letter to 1 Corinthians. But he says, now it's time, brothers and sisters. Now that I come to you, I come to you not in strength or wisdom, but only to speak to you Christ crucified. Now, do you really want to know more about Jesus? It won't come by imitating him as somebody apart from him, as somebody who's received some things. There's going to have to be a union, and you're going to have to break through this thing called Christ crucified. You need to know Christ crucified. You don't know him yet. You know, Jesus my Savior, and Jesus my power, and Jesus my baptizer, and Jesus my healer, and Jesus my preacher, but you don't know Christ crucified yet, and unless you know that, you'll lose sight of the mystery of finding yourself hid in Christ. Now, why does Paul share that? It's because Paul had that experience himself. Now, as we know, Paul was absolutely done in when he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. What a Jesus he saw. What a incarnation. What a glory. What a holiness. What a love he saw there on the road to Damascus. Immediately, he was mastered by Jesus. Immediately, Paul's goal was Jesus, <laughs> right? He became preoccupied with knowing who this Jesus is. I'm going to lay everything behind and I'm pressing onward. I'm going to know more about Jesus. I want to know him. If it's in the power of his resurrection, if it's in the fellowship of his suffering, I want to know him. That's my preoccupation. So, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is this first stage is very important. May Jesus be your preoccupation, your desire, your goal. You want to know him. You'll study to know about him, all of that. And Paul did that. And Paul had as much ambition as Jacob. He was ambitious to serve the Lord. He yielded as a bondservant. He was ambitious to preach to travel from place to place, to be like his master in power and love and service when he preached and went from place to place. Oh, he wanted to be all of those things. He pursued the Lord. He studied the word of God night and day. He went out in the wilderness into the desert to know more about him. The love of the Lord became deeper and deeper in his heart, in his mind. He was a true Jew. Love the Lord your God with all your mind and all your heart and all your strength. And that was Paul, until he hit the wall. Now, what's the wall? When you try to be the Lord by your own strength, it's not going to work out so well in the end. Paul got tripped up and realized, there is nothing good in me. I want to be like the last Adam, and all I see is the first Adam. 
I intend to do good. I want to do good. But sin dwells in my members. And I'm trying and I'm trying. But the more I try, rather than seeing Jesus more clearly, Jesus gets more obscured. And why is that? Because as we struggle in our own natural strength, even in our <laughs> consecrated natural strength, the more our cells grow, the more the Lord decreases. And Paul was growing, but the wrong way. And he had to come to a collapse. He was stymied until he saw Christ crucified. And the life that came out as expressed in Galatians 2.20, which we all know about. A whole new discovery of who he was in Christ. No longer in disunion, but in union with him. This had to be discovered because all of us, because we're fallen sinners, when we first are saved and know the Lord, we're separate from the Lord. The Lord is there and I am here and I'm chasing to be with him. I'm pursuing, I'm going after, and he's out there all the time and I'm moving and I'm moving. But there's a separation. So Paul had good news for the Corinthians. didn't sound like it. He said, Christ crucified is what you need. That sounds like bad news, right? How am I going to know more of Christ? You need the cross. Well, that sounds pretty bad. In other words, you're saying, the only way I, I'm going to know myself is just about when I die. Sounds pretty negative, but no, that's not exactly what's going on. This is the discovery that we have to come to, even as Paul came to it. And so that's why I wanted to use Jacob as an example before David uh, ripped it up in front of my eyes. <laughs> You know, because I'm going to say that Jacob was much like us when we've been touched by the Lord. Now there he saw a ladder. So now he knows God's talking to him. He's talking to God. He, this, he, he knew about, you know, many of you grew up in Christian homes. You knew about Jesus. You knew about him being our high priest, dying for our sins, being our Lord, being our king. You, you've learned all those things. Jacob grew up on Isaac's knee. Jacob grew up hearing the stories of Abraham meeting the God of glory, leaving Ur of Chaldees, a great promise of having a nation and a whole bunch of kids. All of those things, stories of how Abraham walked through the land, met with the Pharaoh in Egypt was protected by God, won great victories, became a big, noble patriarch, and Jacob was just licking those stories up. Man, that's my background. And Christians grow up that same way. Man, that's my background. I'm a, I'm a royal priest. I'm a, I'm a person of God's possession. I'm a son. I'm destined. All these kinds of things, all those stories. You know, he was a, different, a lot different than Esau. Because Jacob loved those stories. Being an ambitious person, of course, he probably liked the perks regarding the story. You know, millions of cattle and sheep, uh, maybe several wives and a whole bunch of tents and a couple of different houses here and there. I'm sure he liked all those outward perks. But he saw something in the calling. He saw something in the birthright. He saw something in the Abraham's heritage. Well, then he met God. There he was laying out there, and the ladder comes down, and the Lord stands at the top of the ladder. <laughs> he was afraid to death. He wasn't ready to unite with God, but he met God. Many of us growing up in Christian homes, you met Jesus. You see yourself in Jesus. I, I am in Jesus. He's my Savior. I, I see myself in him. But like Jacob... Uh, not quite ready to pursue. Jacob had a, big, a lot of agendas. You know, there's some people in this world, not me, who always have agendas. They write a list. They get up in the morning whistling, singing a song, just waiting to write a list. I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do that. Jacob had a lot of stuff he wanted to do. Now he loved God. He met God there, out there in Bethel. He, he saw God. He was afraid of God. He even made a deal with God. Why, I'll tithe if you make me a millionaire. 
and save my life from all danger? God said, okay. Jacob became that millionaire. He wasn't quite ready to pursue. And we grow up, and all I'm saying is somewhere along the line, the reality of wonderful verses that we learn, they all have to become real to us. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Boy, there's an awful lot in those few words. I wonder if you've made them yours. Do you understand those things? Uh, we all know verses like, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God works all things together for good to those who love the Lord, to those according to his purpose. It, they're all of these things we love to say, complete, complete, complete in him. We love all these things. These are true things. But they're all things that we have to enter into the reality of. And thus we come to know him. It's to know him. That's the desire of our heart and enables us to understand things. Poor old Jacob didn't know who he was. I mean, so he knew his name meant uh, grabber. Uh, but he didn't really know who he was, you, as you heard this afternoon. He was actually an Esau wannabe. Now, if your father loved your brother more than yourself, wouldn't you rather be him? And it, it is something Isaac made no bones about it. Yeah, 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 I like Esau. Get out of here, Jacob. Go make some stew. It was flagrant bias there. And I think it hurt. Well, it hurt Jacob enough to where he, he pretended he was Esau for a day with the skins and the whole thing and trying to speak in Esau's voice. And I mean, who are you, Jacob? Well, I, I want to be Esau because I want the blessing that only comes to the oldest son. I feel like I've been gypped somehow. I got to overturn the thing. And actually, can I be honest with you? The blessing that he received from his father was actually his mom's idea. I know Jacob gets a lot of bad, uh, you know, bad press. But he was pretty innocent in that thing. It was his mom that gave her, him the whole idea. Now, of course, mom had a reason too. But it's not to say she wasn't quite carnal in her plans. Now, the reason she wanted Jacob to get the blessing is because of the prophecy when the children were born. And she knew that the Lord said, the older will serve the younger. So she just, as a, any good mom went, went about making that happen. <laughs> Can you imagine being at the river Jabbok and being Jacob and finally the Lord wrestles with you and says, now what's your name? And you finally admit, okay, I'm Jacob. I'm not Esau, I'm Jacob. And the Lord says, okay, good. Now from now on, you're not Jacob. You're Israel. The Prince of God. Son of God. Do you think he had any idea what God was talking about? Oh, he had to... But, but the, the Lord worked in him, so he began to understand these things. And what he began to understand, because the Lord reinstated this thing, in Genesis chapter 35, verse 10, God spoke. Once Jacob had returned to Bethel, God spoke and said this. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. Thus he called him to be Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations will come from you and kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to you and I will give the land to your descendants after you. You see, here's the point. Back in those days, of course, a, a name always meant something prophetically. So for him to be called, uh, now you're a prince of God, is... What did it mean? Well, here's a first clue for us. As we follow the Lord, when he calls us, he calls us to be what he wants us to be. So he said, your name shall be Israel. That's not your name. That's your calling. I want you to be a prince of God. 
I'm going to give you the land that I gave Abraham and Isaac. It's now your land. I'm going to bless you and keep you, and I want you to be fruitful and multiply and become a nation. That's your calling. And in that calling, he would discover who he was. Not just a naming, but a calling. Now, of course, it took Jacob 20 years to be wrestled down through the circumstances of his life, Because earlier in his life, as happens with many Christians, we're too busy with our own agendas. (laughs) Jacob, Jacob was just trying to survive, wasn't he? I mean, Laban gave him a tough time. His job was tough. Then his four wives were tough. And then his children were tough. You know, you can call me Prince of God if you want, God, but it means nothing to me right now. I'm just trying to survive. God has a high and holy calling for us. And even if it takes us 20 years to come into that calling, he will call us. Now, he told Jacob, now your name is Israel, and you're going to be a prince of God, and you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And he was 20 years away from it. Paul got saved. God says, I'm calling you to be an apostle to the Gentiles. 11 years later, he got to be an apostle. So my question to you is, have you discovered, as you're pursuing the Lord, his calling? His calling to you. Because this is a significant moment. And so Jacob went through all of this stuff. And um, you know what? As we'll mention a little bit later. uh, Even though he felt weaker and weaker, it became more and more apparent he was a prince. And unknown to him, what was the number one testimony about who he was? What, 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 what's the number one? That he was a prince? That he did, that he did a great job with his kids? Eh, not so good. What was his overarching testimony? He was a testimony of God's chosen love. So his testimony really wasn't about who he was. His testimony was about who God was in him. Because everywhere through the scriptures you find that Jacob is beloved, chosen, kept, kept by God. He's just such a testimony of grace. Every time you look at Jacob you say, well, if Jacob's like that, I've got a chance. And you start pursuing God. All right beloved of God. Well, this is a good, a good picture for us. Because in that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 passage, I want to go back and look at that for just a moment. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But we see in the passage surrounding that verse two environmental preparations for a deeper revelation. Do you want to know what it means to be a new creation? Then there are a few environmental elements necessary in your life to come into such a revelation. Here's the first one. As you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you realize that Paul has some understanding of his calling and of his being a new creation and involved in a new creation. And how do we know that? Because in the environment, here is a man who has an ambition. Do you have a chief ambition? Does the love of Christ constrain you? Does the judgment seat of Christ motivate you? Is the fear of the Lord pressing you forward? Now listen to Paul. Now we say we want to know our calling, we want to know who Christ is. I say the first element is, are you a real pursuer? A consecrated pursuer? Now if you say, I want to know who I am in Christ, but you're not pursuing, I don't know, I don't think, I don't see the atmosphere. Listen to Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. 
Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. What an ambition. Is that your ambition? Oh, I, I, I don't know who I am. I'm not quite sure at this present moment in my life. But I want as my ambition to be pleasing to the Lord in everything. Ah, now, you're on your way to a discovery of more of who Christ is and of who you are reflexively. Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I don't know if you take seriously this judgment seat of Christ. But when it comes to being a bondservant of the Lord, this should be very much a blessed hope for you and a motivation for you being faithful to what he has called you to do. There is a judgment seat. And the idea, the judgment seat is, let's be positive. There's going to be all rewards at the judgment seat. <laughs> well, it's not really. But are you going to receive reward? The Lord has so much he wants to give out of his kingdom. To those servants, even faithful in little things. Does that make any difference to you? The who, I, who am I generation is so caught up in themselves, they don't even think about such things. Paul does. Verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Wonderful, knowing the fear of the Lord. That doesn't mean he's afraid of the Lord. It means he's afraid of the Lord. He knows the fear of the Lord. He knows the Lord's not fooling around. He knows the Lord means business. And therefore, he's about his business as an ambassador, persuading men. Finally, in verse 14, for the love of Christ constrains us. Wow. He's a, now, is it possible, really, for any Christian to really come to know who they are in Christ if they don't have such an ambition, a pursuing faith? You know, grace, there's a continuum for grace. On the one hand, there's receiving. On the other hand, there's responding. Today's unbalanced teaching has brought people over to this side of grace that just receives and receives and receives and receives, and there's no response and response and response. And the idea almost today is just as long as you become a Christian, then you will grow by osmosis. Somehow you just sit back and you grow. I'm, I'm at this Harvey Cedars this weekend. I'm just sitting back and taking in the ooze. I'm just growing. You know, if our response to having seen how beautiful Jesus is, if we see now what a man is like in the image of God, if we see our God if we don't respond by pursuing him, we have an unbalanced view of grace. Grace pursues after the Lord. It's true, you say. All the promises are yea and amen in Christ. Amen. But let me ask you a question. To whom are all the promises yea and amen? To the people who are laying hold of the promises, believing the promises, living on the promises, moving on the promises, to those people, the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ. So I say that an environment for discovering who Christ is and who you are in Christ involves us moving forward. Now we see Jacob wasn't quite ready for it at the beginning, but after 20 years, he was ready, right? <laughs> uh, Jacob realized he was Adam there at the river Jabbok. So, and that brings us to the second environmental reality. To the person that wants to know who they are in Christ, the environment we see all surrounding 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is this, the cross. The cross is the environment. Is it working death in you? Is there a grave in your life? 
Listen to verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that so they who live might no longer live for themselves. Who am I, Lord? I got to know. No, 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 no. But you're living for him who died and rose again on their behalf. The other day I read a, a T. Austin Sparks devotion. You know, his devotions are as thick as a stew. You know, he just can't read it. Say, okay, I got it. Now you have to... Anyway, he, he was uh, uh, speaking on 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is God's power. And here's what he said. Have you got a cross in your history? Have you got a grave in your history? If you have not, then you are dwelling in the shadows. You may get flashes and touches, but they'll be fleeting, transient, coming and going. Is there a cross in your life? This is the environment. I, Paul says, you know, you know, the whole basis of my ambassadorship, telling people everywhere, be reconciled to God. You know why I'm doing that? It's because I discovered he died for all. Therefore, I died. And now I'm alive, not to live for myself, but for him who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the attitude of the cross. No longer living for myself. <laughs> now, here's the irony, and this is what throws off Christians. It's the Jacob syndrome. Jacob, as we heard this afternoon, David stealing all of my thunder, <laughs> that uh, Jacob went through 20 really tough years there at Laban's house over the wives and over the sheep and over the kids and over the competition of the women and all that. But at the end, Jacob said, I am weary. And yet here's the irony. Jacob became a millionaire during that time. He ended up with two wives, one he loved, the other one, and then two others on the side. He had 12 sons and one daughter. He always came out on top in everything that happened because God was with him. So the strange thing is you say, I've been through such a tough time. And when you look at your life, you see that God's blessed you completely. But all the time you've sensed there's a grave being dug for your life. Jacob spent 20 years eluding the grave. Oh, my father-in-law is going to get me. And oh, Esau is going to get me. All he's doing is just fighting for his life, and yet all the time he's so blessed. But his striving, his flesh, his self-life keeps stealing the blessing from him. But the turning point of Jacob's story, of course, is what happened there at the river Jabbok. David put it in such nice terms. Hey, David's so kind. I'm a, I'm a mean guy. So I'm going to put it like this. The river Jabbok was Jacob's burial. That was the burial. That's where he met Christ crucified. He had a God who was up in the heaven and there was a ladder and angels going up and down and God spoke to him once every 10 years. Kept him, blessed him. God was up there, he was down here. Christ crucified comes and stays with you and wrestles with you. Oh, Christ crucified. The divine veto on our self-life. You know, our life is like the United Nations. And we're in the Security Council and God has veto power. You can come up with any idea you want. Is there something you think is cool and you want to do? I've got this plan. I'm going to make a million dollars and have, you know, uh, some kids and this. And uh, God just says, yeah, okay, no, I veto that. And here is the wonderful discovery of when you discover who Christ is. When you hit Christ crucified or he hits you, you come into resurrection life and discover who you were called to be. 
It's after wrestling at the river that Jacob understood what it meant to be Israel. What does it mean to be Israel? Now I'm going to be a prince of God. I'm going to put on a shield and I'm going to practice my bow and arrow. Here is a prince of God. I'm limping, but I'm always holding on to that cross. That's the staff. And when I make a step, people get out of the way. Now, he was crucified at the river Jabbok. And here is the crossover of the whole thing. Vision. He saw God. Dear brothers and sisters, we talk so much about him. We study a lot of doctrine about him. But there's nothing that will make a person more aware of who he is and reflexively who you are in him than seeing him. A revelation face to face. I saw the face of God and I lived. And at that moment, I also realized something. I have a calling. God wants me to limp right into his purpose. This is to the glory of God that I have to limp this way because the waters part when Jacob moved. Now, uh, David, fin you know, sort of said, okay, and then there was the river Jabbok, and he got up, and the Lord blessed him and took off, and it was sort of, and everything went happily ever after after that. Well, of course, that's not what happened. As soon as the river Jabbok happened, what did Jacob do? Started scheming again, right? Because <laughs> now it's time for Esau to come, and Esau, you, you could just hear, the, 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 and the horses are coming near, and he starts praying to God, oh God, I'll give you 20%. Oh God, I'll give you. He splits the kids up and the children and the whole thing. But here's the difference. It's not like he felt he changed, because he knew he, there was nothing good in him. He was still Adam. That's still me. But now God was always a step ahead of him, getting the victory. God changed Esau's heart. And surprise, surprise. I mean, Jacob didn't know. He's standing there like this, and Esau's, Esau's hugging him and crying. He said, oh, it's so good to see you, Jacob. He says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, who would have believed it? But listen, when you're crucified with Christ, he starts planning your life. He starts overruling in your life. He starts being prince of your life. And you, you still feel yourself. You know, some of the most godly people are not aware of who they are, but they're aware of who he is, which is my whole point. If you want to be caught up in who you are, well, if you look at him, you'll see your calling. And in seeing your calling, you'll realize. Of course, Jacob's story was so beautifully stated again this afternoon. You know what God's after? Sons. Sons. Prince of God. Sons of God. Those who live by his command and by his life and by his kingdom and by his appointment. And so we have to be narrowed down to the ford at Jabbok and dealt with in such a way that when Jacob saw Esau coming over the horizon, basically God says, who is Esau well, before Jehovah's prince? and made Esau yield to Jacob. Prince of God. Well, that's a moment of discovery. And you see, Paul gives us also in his own biographical passages, uh, his own testimony of how the Lord had to deal with him in so many ways, to deal with his flesh, to deal with his ambition, to deal with his desire to be godly. I mean, his whole pharisaical uh, uh, default mode was to strive with willpower to be the holiest and to know the most about the Bible and to do the most more than anybody else. That was his whole pharisaical self-life. I am crucified with Christ. I glory in the cross by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
all of that stuff that seems so important to me. <laughs> I, I throw it aside because what I want to know is him and his righteousness. To know him. And Paul discovered himself as he pursued the Lord Jesus. Paul, at times when he was called upon to, to stand in the authority of his calling, would not back down, but he said, I am called to be an apostle and a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He knew his calling, but it's because he'd been faithful in pursuing the Lord Jesus until he knew more about who he was. This was the turning point in Jacob's life. We have a turning point in our lives as well. Paul had a uh, turning point in his life. I mean, when we think of the road to Damascus, and how the Lord, in fact, shone upon him, and he fell off his horse and fell on the ground, and all of these details, those are the ones that interest us. But when Paul shares his testimony, here's what he says. When the Lord had set me apart from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Now the difference is, when we're saved, we see ourselves in Christ. But we see Christ revealed in us, in a union that enables us to be sons. We can be sons by the life of Christ working within us, working in our character, working in our ministry. It's Christ's life that brings us to sonship. But he saw that. When it pleased God, now it wasn't, didn't seem very pleasing to Paul when he was knocked down on the ground. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me, do you know who you are in Christ? Has Christ crucified been revealed in you? It's a life-changing event. A lot of things are cast aside at such a point, although there's still many lessons to live. And from that moment on, Paul looked away from himself. What does it mean, I, I'm crucified with Christ? Well, just one simple thing is, I stopped looking at myself. Paul tried and tried and failed and failed, and the thing he went to bed and had a hard time going to sleep with was that he'd failed and failed and failed and failed. And God had to say to him, Paul, it's because you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. So quit worrying about yourself. Of course you're dead. Of course you failed. Now look away unto me. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the Son of God, by the faith of the Son of God. There is something that happens where you realize that there's nothing good in you, that you are Adam through and through, and yet Christ has been revealed in you. And you forget about the Adam. You quit ranking on yourself all you do is cut yourself off sometimes when you need to cut yourself off. I'm going to stop, soul. Stop getting involved in your failures. Stop, soul. And by my spirit, I'm going to look at Christ. See who he is. Find his life in this situation. Then every kind of situation we get into, there's his life, there's our life. We throw that stuff away. We find his life. We begin to live on another level. So we, we find Christ Jesus and we find ourselves as we look away from ourselves. That wonderful passage in Hebrews 12 where it's talking about us running, running the race. It says, looking away unto Jesus. And then once again, it means stop looking at your sneakers. Stop looking at your knobby knees while you're running. Look away unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And when we do that, there's a reflexive understanding of our calling, of our race, of what we are in Christ. Again, Paul puts it this way. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, myself. <laughs> now, some Christians look in the mirror and say, who am I? 
let's see. Huh. Am I a teacher, an apostle? Nah, I don't know. If you look at yourself and try to find who you are in the mirror, all you start to notice is the lumps and the little zits and the warts and the problems. It's best to smash the mirror. But as we all behold with unveiled face the glory of the Lord, we get to know ourselves. Not because we become self-conscious, but you know who you are in Christ. But you were looking at him. That's how you found out who you are. And every step in this progress from glory to glory is when we're focusing upon his glory. And just as the sun shines on the moon and the moon reflects the glory and you can see something of who you are because of the glory of Christ, so as long as you're close to the sun, we can see who you are. Sometimes you can't even see it. Many of the God's blessed servants, they, they didn't really even know who they were. He, and even Jacob, after Jabbok, he didn't quite know who he was, but as he walked, everybody else knew. Everybody knew he had patriarchal status, and when he came to the end of his life, in his latter days, he went to Egypt. He walked into Pharaoh. Now, you know, Pharaoh, he, he even sits on a higher platform than Trump. And when you go up to Pharaoh, you bow down and all this. Jacob goes up like this with his staff. He puts his hand on Pharaoh and says, May God Almighty bless you. And Pharaoh says, Who are you? <laughs> because obviously he was just a shepherd. I mean, he wasn't wearing fancy clothes. But there was something princely about him. And he said, I'm Jacob. See, he still knew who he was. <laughs> he didn't say, yes, no, I'm completely Israel. <laughs> he said, I'm Jacob. And I've lived 130 years on this earth, and it's been a struggle. And I haven't attained to the faith and the stature of my parents and grandparents. I'm just Jacob. And then he went one more time before he went out, you know, and he blessed Pharaoh again. Now, he met God along that way, and he knew who he was. And so he came into, he had no idea that he was going to father Jesus out of his family. He, he had no idea that he was one of the three great patriarchs out of which a nation would be formed. I mean, he thought his 13 kids weren't any big deal. They were a big deal. There's a lot of things he didn't realize were important about the things that went on in his life. But all these things became a testimony of how much God chose him, how much God loved him, ah, and so for us. So when God reveals your name, he'll reveal your calling. You know, we have a calling. Do you know your calling? Have you pursued to find your calling? Well, it'll be in Christ Jesus. And the Lord wants you to possess that calling so that you can be like Jacob. Well, anyway, um, the Bible speaks of our calling pretty big terms, right? You're a chosen race, holy nation, royal priesthood, people of God's possession. You're the, you're the glorified sons that the Lord is bringing to glory. There's a, oh, there's a lot of wonderful definitions of our calling. But how does it work out in your life? Well, like Jacob, you're not going to feel particularly fancy about it. Because our calling is sort of like, I mean, maybe you think, hey, you know something? It must have been cool to be an apostle like Paul. I think that's pretty cool. Maybe young people think it'd be cool to be the Apostle Paul. Well, all he was was a servant all his days. who got beaten up and thrown in jail. All kinds of things. Yeah, it was really cool. That's, that's how Paul felt about it. That's really cool, man. I'm an apostle. <laughs> and we have these high qualities, royal priesthood, all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> but, you know, it's like an army recruiter. You know, you go into the recruiting office. They say, you're going to see the world. We're going to give you a wonderful uniform. 
You're going to be the admiration of everybody. And then you get in the army. Forget all that other stuff. Right? You just feel like, I'm a slave. I'm basically serving these people. So maybe you could imagine, what is your calling? Well, it's not just in terms of ministry. Maybe your calling is to be a mother, but maybe you're a teacher. Maybe an apostle. Maybe an evangelist. These things sound pretty good. But if you ever come into those things, you'll see it's just a life laid down. There's no perks, except you get to discover Christ in some unique ways as you follow your calling. So our lives are hid with Christ and God. I don't know what else to say about who you are, <laughs> except this. The Lord came to earth to show us what a man really is. And when you see who Christ really is as a man, you see something of that image that he wants to save and redeem as he saves your soul, as he transforms your life by his life within you. And you begin to follow him. Do you follow him with all your heart? Are you one who people would say, that person is zealous for God? That person wants God. Oh, if you pursue, there's, it, it, it's unimaginable, the things that you will learn about him and about yourself. But if you're a half-hearted, part-time pursuer, I think you'll just kind of go around and around in a wilderness. I don't see much progress there. Are you wrestling with Christ crucified? Has he met you at the Jabbok? Is he wrestling and fighting you with you right now, pulling that strong hip out so that you'll have to depend on him for your forward movement? Is he, have you met Christ crucified? That's what he says to the Corinthians. Oh, you're such great teachers. Oh, you like this apostle, you like that apostle. Oh, you're very liberal regarding the sins of, your, uh, of the people in the church. You need Christ crucified. He vetoes all of that. Plus your human wisdom. If it isn't Christ, it isn't godly wisdom. And the Corinthians were going to have to grow up from being babes who were pursuing Christ and ministry and all such things, trying to be like him, to come against Christ crucified and see Christ revealed in them and seeing the Lord deal from their spirit through their soul, through their body. From an outside sense of being a Christian to an inward sense of an indwelling presence leading you in the Christ life. That's where the Corinthians were at. That's why Paul shared all these marvelous things with them. Oh, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're a new creation. Now I'm going to have to explain what that's all about. And Paul does that with the Corinthians. So is this the case with you and I? Are you limping on that staff in the power of God? It's wonderful. It all begins when we are caught by a vision of Christ. And you see, we, we didn't realize when we first met Christ and we first got saved that we had, that he had a destiny in view for us. We had no idea. Did you have any idea when you got saved? He had a calling and a destiny for you. And he's arranging things toward that destiny. No idea. Just so glad I got saved. Then start pursuing Jesus, seeing him in his word, beginning to sense his call, coming to Christ crucified, and beginning to see who he is in you. May this be our way forward. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful. We're so thankful that Jesus is so large. We're thankful that he not only is the macrocosmic Christ over all things, but he's the microcosmic Christ who dwells within we want to know more about him. We want to search after him. We say with Jacob, who is he? And we pursue after him. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this as our motive and this as our life, to know him and to pursue him. And we're so thankful, Lord, that in the midst of that, a mystery, a secret hidden God comes out as to who we are in him. Oh, do lead us in a proper way as we discover who am I in Christ Jesus. It's all about Christ. It's all about his glory. And as we find ourselves in that, we find understanding of who we are. So thank you, Lord, that you 
Give us this way. Teach us to walk in it. In Jesus' name we pray.